message is from Church of Christ the King, based in Brighton and Hove in the UK. For more information about us, visit our website, cck.org.uk. Okay, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 14 to 23. Let me read to you. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it, and you will be well. So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service. And Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Let's just pray together. God, thank you for this book. Thank you for your presence with us now, and we pray that you would speak to us clearly and reveal to us by word and spirit the glorious nature of your Son, who we would, we would see clearly, we would see more clearly than ever and have our hearts changed by him. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, this is an odd passage. We started on it last week, but uh, only were able to touch on one or two strange features. Well, today we're going to try and finish it off by explaining a little bit about this uh, harmful spirit business. The strangest thing, perhaps, about this harmful spirit is that it's from God. You might think, how can a harmful spirit, or your translation of the Bible might have the words evil spirit, how can that be from God? And then the question after that is, how, how is this kind of evil spirit being scared away when they just play a bit of pan pipes or a little bit, you know, a bit of Ali Jones on the stereo, just kind of helps the spirit to go away? Is, is, what is that about? That seems very obscure, perhaps, to our present culture. Uh, so let's try and understand this a little bit better. I, I suspect that the main reason we find this story peculiar begins with the fact that in our culture, I suppose culture being a very general word there because I know there are many cultures uh, represented in this room, but, but generally in the sort of Western world that Brighton is part of, the idea that there is such a person as the devil and such a, a thing as evil spirits Publicly, at least, that idea is shunned. That idea is ridiculous. It's, it doesn't even get listened to. Uh, I think that's been going for hundreds of years, effectively. The, the, the more kind of mature and modern we've become, the more we've let go of those superstitious ideas that there are such things as devils and demons. These things are crazy. That may be the way that you think. Maybe you're here today with some questions, with some confusion. You're thinking, well, what, what do these people believe in? Do they believe there's a real devil? I mean, do they believe there's this kind of person with horns and a trident and a tail and, and who's got red tights and all the rest? And Now, that, that's a, a common, common misconception of what the devil is. And to be honest, if I were the devil, some of you are thinking, I'm still waiting to see if you are. I, if I were the devil, I think that might be a quite a clever strategy for removing people's sensitivity to me, to make them less on their guard, to put out this popular, grotesque cartoon of myself that made people laugh at the idea that I exist. 
if you go to other cultures, if you go to many of the developing countries and tell them there's no such thing as evil spirits, you go to a part of I don't know, rural Africa or India and say, oh, we know there's no such thing as evil spirits. Some of them would just laugh at you out loud. Others would not laugh at you out loud. They'd look at you politely, but inside they would be laughing at you because they know. They're not stuck in our modernistic worldview. They understand just from reality that, of course, there's evil spirits. But we've, we've dressed up the devil as a kind of cartoon. And I think, really, the way that it works is that it's a little bit like that movie that you probably heard me quote before, The Usual Suspects, which has that brilliant line in it, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was to convince the world he didn't exist. If you tell people that you don't exist, you get to act off the radar. No one knows you're there. You just do whatever you like, and that's what he does. That's how he acts in the Western world. No one knows he's there. No one takes him seriously, so he gets a field day. In other countries, it's perhaps the other way around. People know he exists, and so they, they, they perhaps take him too seriously. They perhaps swing to the other extreme, thinking more about the devil than they do about God. But we've got to accept the fact that, that the Bible teaches in a very healthy way that, of course, there's such a thing as, as an evil spiritual power. Listen, if you believe, and I'm sure most of you here believe that there is a God, I'm sure that if, even if you're not sure you're a Christian, you'd be here at least with the openness to the idea that there's a God. If you believe that there's a spiritual power who's good, it's illogical to assume there can't be a spiritual power who's bad. That doesn't make sense. Of course, it's likely. It's quite likely, as the Bible teaches. Especially, let me make one more point. If you consider the fact that Jesus himself spent quite a lot of his time helping people who were being tormented by evil spirits. Jesus, who, whose teaching was so powerful that... These days, writers, poets, philosophers still look back at Jesus as one of the greatest thinkers and one of the wisest people in history, even those who don't believe in God. All through history, people have tried to match his wisdom, match his insight, match his storytelling abilities. No one's quite managed it. The best stories, the best, the best ideas are kind of pale reflections of what Jesus brought. And yet this wise man, this great fountain of wisdom spent a huge amount of his time setting people free from evil spirits. Now that's telling, isn't it? That shows us that we ought to be a little humbler to think, wait a minute, there is a real issue here. And that's what Saul is dealing with in this story. Now you might think, well, does, does that mean if there's such thing as evil spirits that, that people are basically released from responsibility for their bad deeds? The devil made me do it. That's, you know, that's, that's, a nice get-out clause. If you get into trouble, I did something bad. Oh, that was just the devil. It wasn't me. Sorry, officer. I was just, I know I'm, I'm, I'm 90 and I'm, my breath stinks of vodka. But I, it's actually the devil. Can't help you. Can't help you this time. And then the police was, oh, of course. Sorry, I didn't realize that. Yeah, he's, he's a real pain, isn't he? On your way. That's not going to wash. Obviously, the Bible doesn't teach that satanic or demonic influence makes people not responsible for their deeds. You read the stories of people who are influenced by the devil, including the man who betrayed Jesus. Judas, it says the devil entered him, and it also says that he was responsible. He was to blame for what he did. And you might think, well, how can that be? How can that happen? Well, let's put it like this. The Bible teaches that the human race has been given a, a kind of a freedom, a free will, to choose to honor God and love God with all our hearts or to choose otherwise. And what we've done is we've chosen otherwise. We've chosen to resist God, ignore God, and worship other things. Worship created things, worship ourselves even. Anything rather than worship God. And if that's the case, what does God do? Does God just remove our free will? Does God say, oh, I've made a mistake there. I'll take that microchip out of the, the, the system. That was a mistake. Free will. Ah, bad idea. No, no, no. God the Bible says, in fact, let's just tell you, if you turn to Romans chapter 1, if you, or it'll come up on the screen. This is a, a famous place in the Bible, one of the most important verses for explaining the human condition in the whole Bible. If you want to understand what makes men and women tick, you need to read Romans chapters 1 and 2. But let me just read a couple of verses from chapter 1. It says this, therefore, this is after it talks about us turning our back on God, rejecting God. It says this, therefore, God gave them up. In the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because 
because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is forever blessed. Amen. What's it saying? It's saying God's response to our decision to reject him is to say, you have your freedom. Go. Go. That's perhaps rather a scary thought. But that's what God does. He, he gives us over to what we desire. Even if what we desire will harm us. He says, you're free. You must go. You go, you go. And what we do is we find that the more we reject him, the further we go, the more harm it brings us to, the more, the more danger and damage it brings us to. And, and actually, it's as though God uses some of the pain and the harm that we inherit because of our disobedience to wake us up, to wake us, to shout us back to attention. So, so that we, we realize, gosh, I've turned away from God. He lets us taste what we choose. He says, if you want to worship idols, worship them. See what happens. People ruin and destroy their lives. And in the process, people sometimes suddenly see, gosh, I need God. I made a terrible mistake. But sadly, just as often, it seems, people stay stubborn. And they say, no, 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 no. I, I know it's painful. I know I've taken the wrong route. I know I'm far from God. But anything but going back to God. Anything but that. And they stay in their kind of terrible, terrible descent into destruction, which actually the Bible calls hell. That's what hell is. It's us getting it our way finally. It's us saying, God, anything but you. I will not have Jesus in the center of my life. God ultimately says, I give you over to destruction. It's a horrible prospect. There's a story Jesus told, which, which might shock you a little bit. It needs to shock you because the truth is we don't tend to think this. We, we live in an age where we tend to think that, you know, there's, that humanity is all there is. We are all individuals and we are our own masters. But the truth is that the Bible, the Bible teaches that you actually have to serve God or his enemy. Everybody does in the end. It's like that song Bob Dylan wrote in the early 80s. You've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. You can't get out of that. You might say, well, I've got to serve myself. That's what John Lennon did. He wrote a song straight after. <laughs> that song came out and wrote a song called Serve Yourself. And that was his answer. Say, well, there's no God, there's no devil. You just serve yourself. But here's the thing. If you go on saying, okay, I just serve myself and my interests and my ambitions and my dreams, in the end, the truth is that those things can corrupt you as well. Those things can start to control you in a way you don't even notice at first. You're not really serving yourself. In the end, you're always a slave to something. Even the ambition to not be a slave to something, you can be a slave to. To the point of kind of being chained up, not being able to be free, not being able to be the person that God made you to be, to live in joy. But this is the story Jesus told of a man who was failing to forgive somebody, to release somebody from their debt. He was consumed with bitterness, with a failure to love, a failure to show forgiveness. And Jesus tells this story in, in, in Matthew chapter 18, which finished with, uh, finishes with, with this. Um, let me just find the chapter in the wrong page here. Chapter 18, with these words, verse 34. And in anger, his master, this is the master in this parable is meant to be God, really, delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive, with your, forgive your brother from your heart. Now that's not an, I mean, the word in the Greek is actually tormentors. Jailers in Palestine in the first century were not pleasant guys. They hadn't been on many, you know, courses on how to treat prisoners with respect. They were horrible people. And, and the point Jesus is making is that if you choose to follow the devil's route, even in a sophisticated, subtle, 21st century Brightonian way, it will lead to torment. It will lead to abuse from tormentors. Evil spiritual power will have its way in your life. And that's why we have to preach this stuff about Saul. It seems so irrelevant, but friends, it's directly relevant to you. Who, who are you giving yourself to? Saul's not been giving himself to God's plan for his life. He's 
He's been giving himself to his own personal pride and arrogance and greed and ambition. He's refused God's way. He's turned his nose up against him. He's, he's exalted himself. First of all, in nice, subtle ways, in quite religious ways, Saul always looked like the religious, respectable gentleman. All his life, really, he looked fairly okay. It's just now we're starting to see on the outside what's been going on on the inside. As he's given himself over to wickedness, it's showing outwardly. And there's this monster in the royal palace. What's happened to King Saul? Well, nothing much new has happened. It's what he's been giving himself to for years. What have you been giving yourself to for years? What habits? What, what addictions? What, what thought processes? What bitterness? What grudges? What greeds? What selfish ambitions have you meditated on and ruminated on and just thought for yourself for hours, just greedily turning over these thoughts in your mind? Friends, those things will have you. They'll have you. And sometimes it will feel like agony because you'll realize it in a shock. <gasps> I can't even control myself. That's what happens sometimes to the addict. I haven't watched it yet. I don't think I will watch it. But there's a movie that's just coming out called Shame, which is all about sex addiction. All about a character who is, in all other respects on the surface, a respectable, impressive young man, a leader in society, a high achiever. He's played by a sexual addiction, which, which consumes him every second of his life when he's not with other people. Everything, his webs, his internet, everything. People that he meets, phone lines, everything. And it's exploring the fact that this is a guy who's literally not in control of himself. That's what evil does to you. It beats you into submission. It stops you from being free. It doesn't want you to stand up on your two feet wants you to say, oh, I'm free. I'm free to have sex with whoever I please. I'm free to sleep around. I'm free to look at this website. I'm free to do whatever I want with my money, with alcohol, with drugs. I'm free. I'm free. Cut out the religion. You're not free. You're bound, and you're getting more and more bound, and there'll come the day when you'll cry out in your shock, I'm a slave. That's what's happening in this story. Saul is just coming to this point. And it's all under God's sovereignty. It's not as if God's kind of let, and there's an evil spirit, there's a manic evil spirit that God's not in control of. No, no, it says, from God. Which is a huge lesson. We haven't got time to go into it, but you must understand the Bible does not teach dualism, which means God is on one side, the devil's on the other, and they're kind of you know, punching each other's lights out in the middle of the ring, and we'll see who wins. At the end of history, we'll see who wins. And probably no one, no one ever does in wars. No, no, that's not the way the Bible tells it. The Bible teaches absolutely, just as we've been singing this morning, all hail the Lamb, he reigns victorious, forever glorious. Jesus will not be beaten. We know that very clearly the devil, if you read the book of Job, for example, you get that teaching right there. God is very clear on this. He can't be beaten, he can't be held back. God is under, the devil is under God's control, utterly under God's control. The, God, the devil kind of gets used. It's not that God made him evil. <laughs> God didn't ask the devil to be evil. We don't understand the mystery of how the devil began to be evil, but we do know this, that God is not thrown by it. God can use even his wickedness against him. God's good at judo. He knows how to use the force of the enemy against him. So he's using the forces of the enemy to, to show Saul how desperate he is. But what does Saul do? Let's look at the way that this works. The response that Saul's court comes up with is, in a word, therapy. Therapy. And it's an interesting kind of therapy. In verse 18, it's, it's musical. Let's just read this. One of the young men answered, Behold, I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. And his name is Michael Bublé. I don't know, that's what, who, what kind of guy is this? This, this, this singer, whoever he is, he's, he's, he's obviously got the goods. Verse 19, therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse. Maybe if Michael Bublé came, the devil would have just stayed. He would have been like, oh, I like this. Who knows? Verse 19, he definitely would if it was James Blunt. Verse 19, therefore... Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. So 
They've, they've solved the problem. Solved the problem. Music, bit of music. Now, let's just stop for a second because this is fascinating and I hope I've got time to try and unpack it a little bit. Let's not miss the fact that music in this story and through the Bible, in fact, is spiritually powerful. Isn't that interesting? It is genuinely powerful. It's, it's in fact, a, an enormous gift given by God to the human race. It's in fact, if you look at it properly, it's right in the very heart of the way God has made things. It's the way we're wired for a start. If you didn't come to church today, and some of you are wishing you hadn't, if you didn't come to church, there was a, there's a program you could have listened to on Radio 4 where they interview somebody, ask them their life story, and they tell you their life story, but instead of just telling them a few stories, they say their favorite songs as well. And they play eight of their desert island discs. And it's an interesting concept because it's like it's saying, you know, to really understand people, words will say a lot of it, but you know, people's music, it actually says something else about their life as well. You get to know them a bit through that. That's kind of in the way we're wired, but you know, actually, it's even deeper than that. Martin Luther, one of the greatest Bible teachers in history, German from six centuries ago, five centuries ago, just a total hero, wonderful man. He was a, he was a huge fan of music. Ah, just loved music, loved it. But he also knew that it had spiritual power. And he would read the story and say, well, there you heard, that's proof. Music has power to overcome the evil one. The devil hates music, he used to say. The devil hates music. As we sing our songs to God, the devil hates it. But just as we play beautiful music, he hates it too. Why? Well, I don't, there's not a lot of explicit teaching. There isn't the book of music in the Bible. You don't get a lot of teaching about it. But there's a few hints. Think about this. In Job 38, it talks about how when God made the world... It says the morning stars sang together for joy. That is a fascinating verse. You can read past that and stop, not stop to think, what does that mean? I wonder what that would be like. Is that just poetry? There's a lot of poetry in the Bible. Or is it actually meant to describe something? The Bible often talks about singing and music as a way of showing something that, that, that goes beyond just words. It's interesting as well that if, if the Bible says that at the point of creation, when God was busy making things, there was music, music, music just exuding from everywhere. There was all this joy ex expressed through tunes, through rhythms, through melodies and harmonies and chords. When you get to the end of the Bible, it's even clearer. Not necessarily the end of this, the whole Bible, but the end of the story it teaches. You get to places like Isaiah 55 that talk about how God will change things at the very end of time. And there's these uh, descriptions in the last few chapters of Isaiah of a new heavens and a new earth when God makes everything new. Everything. Everything. The mountains, the hills, the rivers, the lakes, the, the animals, us. Everything is renewed and restored. One of the ways it describes it in chapter 55 of Isaiah, verse 12 for you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace and the mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. Singing, not chanting, not only talking, not even sermons. Singing. There's something that comes particularly through singing. God, God wants a universe which is filled with this kind of expression of wonder and glory that, that actually music exclusively can do. That's, that's the way God's ordered things. Break forth into singing. And the trees of the field shall clap their hands. So at the beginning of creation, you've got music in creation. At the end, when God restores and there's a new creation, music <laughs> everywhere. If you don't like music, go to hell. That, that's, that's all I can say. That's the way it's going, okay? And you think, actually, what it says in, in Romans chapter 8 is, is, is fascinating because it talks about the current creation. What's happening now in the, in the middle? Creation, new creation. What's happening? Romans chapter 8. In this world where we, there's sin, there's fallenness, there's brokenness, there's despair, there's disease, there's injustice, there's death, there's all kinds of wickedness. We groan. Creation groans. doesn't sing. Groans. <laughs> but God's desire is that all creation sings his praise. Isn't that interesting that, that when we see music, 
in the culture, in the wider culture. Sometimes for people, it's like it wakes them up to the possibility that there's something beyond. It, deep in people's hearts, the Bible teaches that everybody knows deep down that there's a God. They know there's a God, but they reject, they resist, they come up with good arguments or apparently good arguments. But music is sometimes the thing that wakes people up. People start to hear music and start to think, well, maybe it's just, this, this is so meaningful. This says something that I can't even, there's something so powerful about this music. Maybe there's more to life than just the, the atoms and molecules that make up my biological cells. There might be something more. And music can have such power. It's a phenomenal thing. And we should take that seriously. We should acknowledge that and realize that music is not a small matter in the Bible. When we come together, the Bible never says, when you come together, just chant. You actually see, you read places like Colossians chapter 3, verse 23, where it speaks about letting the word of Christ dwell within you richly. Colossians 3.23, or no, Colossians 3.16, I should say. Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell with you richly. And you might think, what does that look like? What does it look like when a church like this, or one of the other sites, lets the word of Christ dwell richly amongst us? Well, I'm sure it looks like a lot of preaching, to be fair. Definitely some teaching must be involved. A lot of us reading our own Bibles, for sure. But what does Paul then go on to say? I'll read it from here rather than turn. Uh, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs in thankfulness in your hearts to God. That's what Paul means. Yeah, teaching, admonishing, getting in each other's lives, talking, talking, but also singing. The word of Christ dwells in us because we sing it. It does. That's how it's been for me. There are whole chunks of the Bible that I know off by heart, not necessarily because I've done the hard work of memorizing them, just because I grew up singing Dave Fellingham's songs. <laughs> And you knew how to put the Bible to music. So you just get it in your gut. It just gets in there. You can't get it out. That's a gift. Music is a pr tremendous gift. I could go on and on, but we need to, to move on. Because there's a, a massively important balance to this that you need to hear. And I want to finish with this. So listen really carefully. If you miss this, it, it's, it's going to be a mistake. Let me just... Go to verse 23 at the very end. Whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Now, if you read that carefully, you get the sense that this kept happening. So, yeah, David's singing helped. David's playing, I should say, helped. The music lifted Saul and took away the evil spirit, at least temporarily. Temporarily. It was at best a short-term answer. And that tells us as well that though the gifts that God gives, like music and like many other things, food, drink, friendship, family, I don't know, anything just furniture, somewhere to stay, a place to live, warmth, home. The gifts that God gives can settle us, can steady us, can refresh us. They can be channels of God's good grace to us. And they should be, and they must be. But please, please hear this. They're not God. They're not God. However beautiful and wonderful those things are, they're not God. All the gifts that we have are, are things that we can relish in and, and take delight in. But they're really, the, the point of them is, is, is God intends to use them to kind of lead us, to tug us to himself. The gift is a clue to the giver. But if you never acknowledge the giver, if you don't accept the giver, if you don't put the giver at the heart of your life, if you don't let the giver govern you. If you don't trust the giver and believe in the giver, then even if the music soothes you for a while, all it's really doing is anesthetizing you. Rather than giving you the cure, it's just taking some of the pain away. And this is what we tend to do. We, we, we accept God's blessings in our lives, but on our terms. We receive them, not with thanks, but with assumption, with a sense of 
sense of entitlement. Sense of, well, this is, of course, this is what I need. Well, he's, that's, that's his job. He's supposed to look after me and help me. And I think we do that with all of his gifts, music included. Music is just one of the many gifts, creative gifts that God's given to us. And it can soothe us, it can rest us, but you can't soothe a volcano. And Saul has become that. He has become this bubbling, spewing mountain of lava. Under the surface, that's what's going on. It's just, just beginning to show in anger, violence, hatred, curses, bitterness. And it's not just a harsh temper, it's an extreme temp, temp, temper. If you look over to chapter 18, you get how this happens. This is, while Saul, this is in this story, while David is playing to him. This is while he's sticking the sticky plaster on. This happens, chapter 18, verse 10. The next day, a harmful spirit from God rushed upon Saul and he raved within his house while David was playing the lyre as he did by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul hurled the spear, for he thought, I will pin David to the wall. But David evaded him twice. That's why he's doing it. That's not just after a bit of withdrawal symptoms. It's not like, you know, a few weeks oh, he hasn't sung for a while. I'll throw a spear. No, it's while it's happening. What, it, what does it say? It's saying this. The anesthetic is wearing off. This little short-term soothing strategy of, of, well, let's just, try and soothe, let's just try and solve the problem through this temporary, let's put some music out, let's give them some therapy. It's good, don't mistake me. I just said all that stuff about music because I want you to hear this. God gives us good gifts to enjoy, but they're not God. And you can enjoy all the gifts and all the blessings and everything, but still say no to God. And keep saying no, keep saying no. And friends, in the end, even the gifts and the, bless, the pleasure they bring will wear off. That's what any addict will tell you. That's why they're addicted, because they, they feel enslaved. But in reality, the joy they receive from the next, I don't know, the next injection, the next whatever. Every trip gets less and less valuable to them, less and less pleasurable. And you start doing it not because you're enjoying the delight, but because you cannot stand the agony of being without it. But you still keep doing it, you still keep doing it. It's like the pleasures, the, 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 and that's, that's, that is it. That's what, if we, if we make gods out of created things, that is the way we will go. That's the way that many believers go. But that may be the way, you, you may not be a Christian here today, and you may have never thought of it this way. I want you to understand, God isn't interested in just soothing you. He is interested in changing you, utterly changing you. He, he's happy to soothe you. That's good. But friends, if that's all you get from him, then all that's happened is you've been anesthetized against the real danger. And the pleasure was meant to lead you to him. It was meant to be a sign. David's playing should have made Saul think, gosh, gosh, I remember that sense of beauty. I remember that sense of liberation, that sense of peace. I remember that from years ago when I used to worship with Samuel and I used to feel so happy and so free but all I've felt for years is this sense of guilt and, and burden and stress. Well, I'm glad you came to make me feel a bit better, David. Thank you for that. When he should have said, David, please, do you know God? Can you help me get back to God? Can you help me? Even if I have to kneel down and cry, even though I have to, if I have to just, I don't know, just beat myself, whatever it takes, I want to get back to God. I'm so sorry. I miss God. And he didn't do that. He would never do that. He was still so stubborn. He was so lost. What about you? Is that, is that you? God's gifts to you, friends, they're like, they're like you know, the story of Theseus and, and, and the Minotaur, the old Greek hero. He, he wants to go into this maze, this labyrinth, to find a, a monster to fight. But he knows he could get lost. People die in this labyrinth. They all die because they get lost. They didn't get killed by the monster. They just get lost in the maze. So he takes a big ball of string, just throws it and just leads it so that he'll always be able to be led back, always be led back. And God gives us gifts so that we'll just pick them up and say, well, where does this go to? Where does it go to? Where does it go to? Instead, what we do with the gifts is we say, this is all about me, my appetites, my personal needs, my personal desires, and my ambitions in life. It's got nothing to do with you. We cut the string, and we stay dying in the maze. Is that your story? Friends, is that the story of your life? 
Because it could be. Even people who come to church, it could be. People come to church all the time and miss. I've, had, I've stood in meetings where I've preached and said, I don't want you to tell me at the end of this message that that message made you feel warm. I remember doing this a few years ago. I, I said in the sermon, please don't tell me after this sermon that the sermon was nice and it made you feel warm. And that week, I, felt I was pushing one of my kids on the swing in the playground. Someone comes up to me while I'm doing that and says, I recognize you, that preacher. I, 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 I heard you, your message. It was lovely. It made me feel warm. Oh! Maybe it was a few days <laughs> the person had just forgotten that, that I'd warned them. But we do this. Yeah, we, we, oh, thanks for the little bit of encouragement. Friends, if you only hear little soothing encouragements from God, you're not hearing him. Because the situation is more serious than anesthetic can deal with. There's a deep, deep rebellion in the heart of people against God. There's, there's really, there's no way you can solve it just by neat solutions. You need what the Bible calls repentance. Repentance, which basically means, or literally means, changing your mind. Change, you change your mind. And that changes, it means everything, really. It means your whole heart. It means your whole, whole orientation of your life changes. You used to think that God didn't matter. Suddenly you realize, oh my goodness, does he matter? You used to think you could live your life on your own terms and just have God in, sprinkled in at the end on the top of your life like some bits of chocolate over a cappuccino. A bit of God. And you see how evil that was and you feel so sorry and you say, God, forgive me. And you know what? The thing about repentance, it kind of never stops. Because you, you, the closer you get to him, the more you realize, I'm, I'm in need of you. I, I can't do this without you. I, help me. Forgive me. I'm sorry. We still realize, the more we get close to him, the more we see, see as it says in 1 John, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Repent consistently. We say, God, you are God. That's what repentance ultimately is. It's saying, I'm not God. You are God. And I must submit humbly to you. And Saul would not do that. I was thinking this week about a, uh, a story that you may well know. One of the Narnia books that um, absolutely love reading. It features... Uh, one of, the, one of the most horrible boys you could imagine. And he gets turned by Aslan the lion into a dragon. And the reason Aslan the lion turns him into a dragon is for the very thing I've been talking about today. Because on the inside, that's what he is. He's a horrible, spiteful, proud, malicious boy. And it's like Aslan, who is supposed to be Jesus in these stories, makes him see how wretched, how monstrous he is because he becomes on the outside what he's been on the inside. And he hates it. He cries out. Unlike Saul, he goes the whole way. Let me just read to you what he describes how it happens to one of his friends. I started scratching myself, my skin, my scales, and I scratched a little deeper, and instead of just scales coming off here and there, my whole skin started peeling off beautifully. In a minute or two, I just stepped out of it. I, I could see it lying there beside me, looking nasty. But just as I was going to put my feet into the water, I looked down and saw that they were all hard and rough and wrinkled and scaly, just as they had been before. Oh, that's all right, said I. It only means I had another smaller suit on underneath the first one, and I'll have to get out of it too. So I scratched and tore again, and this underskin peeled off beautifully, and out I stepped and left it lying beside the other one and went down to the well. Well, exactly the same thing happened again, and I thought to myself, however many skins have I got to take off? So I scratched away for the third time and got off a third skin, just like the other two. I stepped out of it. But as soon as I looked at myself in the water, I knew it had been no good. And the lion said to me, you will have to let me undress you. I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you. But I was pretty nearly desperate now. So I just lay flat down on my back to let him do it. 
The very first tear he made was so deep that I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peeled off. Well, he peeled the beastly stuff right off, just as I thought I'd done myself the other three times, only they hadn't hurt. And there it was, lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker and darker and more knobbly looking than the others had been. And there was I, smooth and soft. See, the real change that has to happen to us, we can't perform it through our own comforts, through our own attempts to make ourselves feel better. It's just like taking off a superficial level of skin. God is committed to changing you from the heart. God's committed to turning you completely inside out, changing you in a, in a pure and giving you a new heart, new identity. And, and I'm talking to everybody here, especially those of you who aren't yet Christians, who are here just listening and watching. Friends, you must know the God who, yeah, he will cut you, but out of love and out of care and out of help. God will do that. And it will happen. It will happen in all kinds of ways. By putting your life in his hands, you're doing that. You're saying, just like Eustace does here, I've got to lie down and let him do it. That's kind of what becoming a Christian is like. You're sort of lying down and saying, okay, God, I I can't do this, but I do entrust my whole life to you. You really are trustworthy. I know that you can look after me. And however religious and kind of specially religious Saul looked all his life, he never did that. At least he certainly isn't in this story. Where's your heart? What are you you living for? What are you doing with God's commands to you, with his calls to you, with his gifts to you, even with the pain he puts upon you? Are you seeing it as his blessing in your life? Are you seeing it as a sign towards him that will draw you back to himself? He's the one that's able to deal with the pains that you've got, but at a much deeper level. See, what Saul needed ultimately wasn't a musician. As much as a musician was a blessing and a great blessing to him, what he needed really was a priest. He needed someone who could deal with his shame, with his guilt. The, the, the music helped him with the guilt feelings for a little while. And maybe a bit of therapy, a bit of self-help, a bit of encouragement, even some good encouragement from a Christian friend, even someone saying to you, you're doing okay, you're doing fine. I, you know, I think the world of you. That will do you some good for a while. Friends, it will. I don't doubt it at all. But you know as well as I do, it doesn't actually meet the real need. Because what you need is a priest. What you need is someone who can do more than come and sing songs. Someone who can come and take the burdens away. And carry them for you. Someone like Aslan. Someone who will come and help you. And it might hurt. And it might cost you. And you might think, but what about my relationships? What about my money? What about my ambitions? What about... My, my, my marriage, what about I, if I put God first, if I trust God, if I repent, if I, put, if I stop sleeping with this person, if I stop lying, if I stop cheating, if I, if I tell everybody the truth about what's really been happening, what will happen to me? I, I can't trust you, God, I can't. I just don't believe it will work out right. It will be a disaster. It won't be a disaster. It might be painful, but it won't be a disaster because what will be happening is your healing. God will be changing you. God will be making you to be the person you're meant to be, like Eustace at the end, with smooth and soft skin. (laughs) Free. Liberty. Joy. Forgiveness. I'm at home with God. God's at home with me, and I'm at home in the world. It will take pain to get there, and you need a priest. You You need a savior. You need someone who will deal with the sin. And David wasn't quite that. But there was a greater David to come. There was a son of David. There was a descendant of David. A thousand years later, another boy would be born in Bethlehem. 
And he, he didn't just sing songs to soothe people's pain. He gave a lot of joy. He healed the sick. He cast out demons. He loved people. He showed tenderness and mercy. But the real, real clincher, the real achievement was when he couldn't sing. He could only groan. If you were watching as he died on the cross, you'd have not heard a, <clears throat> a sweet melody. You'd have heard agony, cries, desperation. God, why have you forsaken me? He took your place. So the groans that you should have to make forever and ever and ever, cut off from God, they've been sung out already by a dying man. And the Bible says that there will be a day when he will lead us in song, in Hebrews chapter 2. When he will sing amongst the church, the redeemed people of God. He will lead the worship that day. In perfect voice. But to be with him, you, you need to turn to him now. Now, not tomorrow. Now. You need to say, Jesus, say this, say this in your heart. If you're ready today to become a Christian, and some of you, this is exactly what you need to do right now, and you know it is. You don't need me to tell you because in your heart you know it. It's like your heart's thumping and you know it. Just say this to him. Say, Jesus, I'm sorry for my sin. I've been like Saul. I've ignored you. And I don't want to go further into sin and rebellion. I turn my back on my sin. I change my mind. Jesus, you are now the Lord of my life. Jesus, you are my saviour. Jesus, you died on the cross for my forgiveness. Jesus, I trust you. Come and live inside me from this time on. Amen. For others of you, and we'll just stand in a moment and sing and celebrate, and I want us to really sing. It's not that you need to become a Christian today, but you know what I've been saying is still about you. It's still about you. You, you need to repent. You need to. You just need to say, oh, so sorry, God. I've, I've become hard-hearted, and I've been trying to find little solutions to the big problem of my heart getting hard. And you need to say, oh, sorry. How do you do that? Well, you can do that by praying right now. You can do that by taking bread and wine with us if you're a Christian, celebrating what Jesus has done. You can do that by talking to somebody Probably the most important way you do it in reality is by carrying on talking to somebody, by being in the church. If you're not in community, if you're not with people, if you cut yourself off, you come on Sundays but you're not really in a small group, you're not in community, you're not opening your life up to other Christians who can help you, talk to you, serve you, you're going to be like Saul anyway because that's what he did. He cut himself off. He didn't say, where's Samuel? I need Samuel. No, I don't want Samuel. I don't want input. I don't want help. You need to be in community, friends. You must. If you're not, take action today. Get in the Connect system. Get a card in front of you, if you like. Tick the box to get part of the Connect group, small group, and join us properly.